Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Pitching Lighting Designs, Workflows for Renders and Plots with Craig Rutherford. My name is Michael Grandetti and I'm a Content Marketing Coordinator here at Harman. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and you will try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as by visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and cer cer certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I would like to introduce the presenter for today's webinar. Craig Rutherford is a lighting designer based in Minneapolis, where he lives with his partner and their five children. Having had an interest in production since childhood, he's worked as a technical director, a touring lighting director, and a full-fledged production and lighting designer. And now, I'll pass it over to you, Craig. Well, bienvenido, welkommen, or vitete, whatever works for you. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Craig Rutherford, and today is Tuesday, March 30th, 2021. Or perhaps it's later than that. In that case, hello, future people. Or perhaps it's earlier than that, in which case, uh, please do not cause any multiverse ending paradoxes. Uh, my name, as I said, is Craig Rutherford. I am delighted to be with you here today in spirit and IPv4 packets, if not in body. Uh, before we get started, it is my sincere hope that all of you are well. And let us take a moment to hold in the quiet sanctuary of our hearts the names of those we know are not doing well. Um, unemployment remains high across our industry. Uh, some parts of my own country are still recovering from the devastating effects of unconscionable violence in the past few weeks. And we acknowledge the ongoing currents of grief uh, that have been caused by the continuing public health crisis. To my brothers and my sisters and everyone in between and beyond, I say to you that we will come out of the other side of this. The dawn will come and the day will break end with humility and hope we will return to the critical business that we do. We are more than just lighting designers and we are more than just front of house and monitor engineers and techs and grips. We are the bearers of broadcasts and the stewards of the words of Baldwin and Shakespeare. We are the force behind the curtain that helps the nervous young executive get ready for their first speech. We are the nearly invisible camera operators, capturing a singer, giving the performance of their life. And we are the purveyors of drama and pathos in light and music and video and sets. We are the lifeblood of an industry that I am humbled and honored to call my own. Stay strong, take care of yourselves, be kind. It is again a privilege to be where, be here with you. And I'm again humbled that you have taken the time to join with me here today. As always, uh, a big thank you to Martin Professional and Harmon, and especially uh, Michael Grandinetti and Brad Schiller for bringing us all together in this way. So in my last webinar, uh, we explored the topic of lighting design in a theoretical sense. What I wanna do in this webinar is discuss one possible workflow, the one that I use, when I'm getting ideas from my brain onto paper, into a computer, and ultimately, hopefully, uh, in front of a client. Uh, in contrast to my previous webinars, I want this one to be a little bit more on the practical side of the sliding scale of theory versus practice. So we'll start out going over getting ideas out of your head and onto paper, and then into a computer, and then two ways of presenting that information visually as both plots and renders. And after that, we'll examine two case studies from my own, uh, my own past. And we'll talk about the difference between pitching your ideas to a client blind versus to a client who might be involved in the process from the very, very beginning. So let's start the discussion by saying that this is my workflow and it may not necessarily be the one that you ultimately adopt. What I hope is that something about my process will be useful or that you'll perhaps find some good tips in there. Um, I don't think that everyone should run out and start doing exactly what I'm doing. That's not really what I'm going for. So to begin, let's talk about the workflow common to both situations, both 
pitching to a client blind and clients who are going to have input into the design process. Uh, and our starting place, naturally, will be generating and drafting your ideas. And we'll start with generating your ideas. So uh, inspiration and creativity have their own million dollar industry dedicated to churning out books, all kinds of things that you can buy on Instagram uh, the, to help you, claim to help you with your creativity. Uh, what I believe is that every person is different and what inspires one person will not necessarily inspire another. There is, however, some general advice that I think is relevant and some things that have worked for me. Uh, so books. Books and literature are a nearly endless source of inspiration. And while art books are an obvious place to start talking about books vis-a-vis -vis inspiration, they're far from the only place that you can look. The world of literature is vast, from the epic science fiction worlds of Asimov to the cyberpunk of William Gibson to the, the paranormal dread of Stephen King to everything in between. And anytime a book does that wonderful magic that words printed on a page can do and lets you imagine the details of a space on your own instead of seeing it, that is a rich source of inspiration and creativity right there because how you imagine it's going to be is going to be different than how everyone else imagines it. There's also art. That's another obvious one. I think most people are probably conscious of on some level, but it bears repeating here. A trip to an art museum can be a terrifically mind-opening experience. And not only looking at other people's art, but practicing a form yourself, be that writing or drawing or clay sculpture or freeform building with Lego uh, can be stimulating in some of the best ways possible. Books like The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron can be helpful in giving the readers some exercises to do on a daily basis to help express yourself creatively. And boredom. Yes, boredom. It sounds strange, but we live in a busy world where the possibility of entertaining yourself at any moment of the day is often, quite literally, in the palm of your hand. Now, I am not a technological Luddite, uh, but I certainly want to advocate here for occasionally and at healthy intervals, putting the phone down and just doing nothing for a while. Slow down, sofa surf, stare out the window, let your mind wander and clear itself. The things that come to us in silence can be some of the most profound. Now, as I've said in previous webinars, keeping that which inspires you around is an excellent way to, well, stay inspired. Um, I have some big Dan Flavin coffee table books. I have some big folders on my laptop called lighting inspiration and set design inspiration. Uh, for any time that I see a cool picture or illustration or anything that strikes my fancy. Another powerful tool for documenting inspiration, because it doesn't always happen at convenient times is your cell phone. We're all walking around with computers in our pockets with a camera resolution and processing power that NASA could not have in their wildest dreams imagined in the 60s when they were sending people to the moon with pocket calculators and slide rules. But inspiration also takes discipline. Have your recording tools, whatever those are, uh, around you in close proximity to record thoughts whenever the whim strikes you. Sometimes that might be at 4 a.m. Sometimes it might be while you're eating dinner. Any of us who regularly make art or drawings of any sort know what I'm talking about here. Something cool really can pop into your head without any prior warning, like a reverse robbery, and you got to be ready for it. So, these are just a few suggestions that have worked for me. Uh, and there are lots of resources on YouTube and other books that address the need that we as designers have to be creative and generate ideas. So I won't spend any more time on that particular subject. So you have some ideas in your head. Good news, that's one of the hardest parts that you just got out of the way. So let's move on to getting ideas out of your head and onto some medium that has longer staying power than the human memory. Now, when you're just starting out with initial sketches, I don't think it's necessary to get too worked up about 
the physical constraints of reality. Just get ideas down. Commitment, uh, committing an idea to some form of semi-permanent medium, whether that's digital or analog, is all you need to do. I'm even going to go so far as to say that anything that you commit to a drawing is probably a good idea and that truly bad ideas are extremely rare. The first thing that you get down isn't likely to be the final form of anything, but drawing even something that doesn't work helps to refine and hone the looks and forms that do work and ultimately can guide your thinking towards a finished product that you can use. And once you've started with your initial sketches, don't stop. Keep drawing. Keep making little improvements and testing different ideas. This is the idea of iteration or creating successive variations on a theme. And it's something that you should get into the habit of doing, even if you really like a concept or a drawing. And something that I like to do is leave little notes to myself that includes the thoughts I have about a particular sketch. Sometimes I'll really like something or I'll really dislike something and articulating why in the comments or margins of my notebook can be helpful in deciding why I like it or why I don't like it or for a particular client or set. Scale is also important to start considering at this stage. Sometimes small stick figures can be helpful when sketching to decide on a sense of scale or you know, doing some simple drawings to get a sense of how this set or production design is going to fit into the arena or theater that will serve as the venue. Now, I prefer pen and paper, but if you're into drawing on a digital device like an iPad or a Surface, there are plenty of options. I have tried Paper, the app by 53, as a way to draw simple sketches before. It's a fairly low cost option. A lot of people also like the app Concepts, which is available on Windows or Android and iOS devices. Personally, drawing digitally isn't really my thing. I'm not very good at drawing systems that set out to emulate the physical experience of drawing with traditional media, but a lot of other people seem to like doing it, so your mileage may vary. Uh, my favorite uh, notebooks, like, like you'd care, but I'll tell you anyway, are a look term 1917 softback for notes and a traveler's notebook for sketching. Uh, whatever method you use, it's important that you have a system of organizing your drawings in a logical way. Uh, let me also throw in this important note. Don't treat your sketchbook or your drawing program like some sort of ivory tablet upon which must only be engraved the best and purest and most perfect ideas. If you think that way, you'll never put anything down. The more you can get down, the more you can refine, the more content, the creative part of your brain has to work with. Now, at this point, uh, something that can be helpful is to do a quick, quick sketch of how the lighting will be laid out. Spots and washes, a few different views, side, top, front, can be really helpful in allowing you to visualize what you want the lighting to look like before you have to go through the work of placing them into a 3D environment, which is always more work. So just dot in some little squares and circles for spots and washes, whatever it takes for you to remember. Something super simple, just to start yourself thinking about the lighting design. So uh, you've sketched your set designs, you've written down some basic lighting notes, you've adjusted, you've tweaked, and you're fairly happy with what you've got. Now we move on to drafting our design. Drafting is an important step. It allows you to be much more precise with your scale and placement and realize and fix problems with the physical layout. Uh, the options for drafting, I think quite a bit more limited than for sketching. In my workflow, I use Vectorworks. Uh, it's an industry standard software suite for a reason. It's not the only solution for doing entertainment drafting, but it's probably the most widely used. There's also AutoCAD, which I know some riggers uh, that tend to gravitate toward, toward that suite. I think the advantages of Vectorworks Spotlight over AutoCAD is the suite of entertainment-specific tools that Spotlight gives you, uh, as well as the 3D tools. Vectorworks Spotlight has some quirks, but overall, it's the best for the job. 
One disadvantage of drafting in Vectorworks or AutoCAD, however, is that these are big programs and they tend not to run well on anything less than fairly recent hardware without some headaches. Um, and they can be expensive. A perpetual license of Vectorworks Spotlight with maintenance will set you back like $3,700 plus another 600 a year to keep your software and your libraries current. And if you get Vectorworks, I think it's definitely worth it to keep it updated. Now, if Vectorworks is making enough money for you, uh, enough to at least break even, then by all means, it's probably a worthwhile investment. Um, but if you're just starting out, my advice is don't get too deep into technical software too quickly. I believe it's worthwhile to invest in a dedicated drafting software suite eventually, but there are some lower cost options out there that you can use when you're just starting out. One that I used for many years was SketchUp, which used to be owned by Google and it's now owned by Trimble. Uh, very sadly, the free basic version of SketchUp as an application has moved to an online only version, which is lacking some of the functionality of the old application, though not a lot. Uh, they do make a version called Pro, uh, which you can purchase for $300. Uh, it's still not a tiny investment, but it's a lot less than a full copy of Vectorworks. And there are some third party renderers for it that will make your designs look nice, though they're largely geared toward architectural designs. Um, another option is Drafty, which is an app that I have reviewed for PLSN in the past. Uh, Drafty is subscription based, but the basic versions are pretty inexpensive. Uh, it does lack any 3D capability. It is for making 2D lighting and set plots only. Now your 2D drawing can get as complex as you want it to get, but it's really intended for just one view at a time. And that isn't gonna help when it comes to trying to create renders for clients. It is, however, a really decent and very affordable option for doing basic 2D plots. And indeed, you can make those plots look really, really good. So for all these reasons and some others, uh, in my uh, workflow, I start my digital drawings within Vectorworks after I do you know, the basic layout on paper. Now there have been, and there are great tutorials for creating really excellent plots. Uh, Michael Sharon did one for the Martin Professional Learning Sessions uh, that you're watching now, and you should definitely go back and check that out on YouTube. Uh, a brief aside also, I'm using the term plot here to refer to two different types of documents. A plot can have varying levels of detail. For instance, a detailed lighting plot could include things like focus positions and DMX addresses, channel numbers, electrical circuit information. Um, that isn't what I mean here. A detailed plot like that is not what I need to send to potential clients. Detailed plots are a tool that the lighting shop, the project manager, uh, and the lighting technicians need when they're putting together a rig. But what I want the client to see is a lighting design. And that's really about them seeing where the lights go and to give uh, uh, some of the more technically inclined people who might be looking at it a sort of basic understanding of the lighting placement and layout and scale. So I wanna get lights placed around in places that will create the lighting effects I want to use in the particular production. Uh, but a fully numbered and annotated broad sheet of information isn't what those people need. So while I'm intentional about placement and I'm intentional about making sure that things are appropriately and well-placed and take the time to do the actual lighting layout like I normally would, I don't worry about creating detailed plot views that show DMX addresses, fixture numbers, circuit information, that sort of thing at this stage. So uh, this is the point in my workflow where I acknowledge the strengths of Spotlight, and I really try to use plugins to their full potential here. Spotlight has a lot of them, and they're generally very good. I start uh, generally by building the stage that I'm going to be working on, which for most arena productions is a 40 by 60 stage, usually about five to six feet tall. It was a very useful tool in Vectorworks for building stage decks and various sets of stairs that's very useful for this. Uh, from there, I will move on to building the set. Now, everybody likes to do their Vectorworks files in a different way. 
I'm pretty retentive about keeping my, my classes and my layers and especially my asset manager structure clean. Intelligent light symbols have their own folder. Each light has its own class with its own color. I typically divide layers as logically as I can, and I preface the layer name with what they are. So mod or set for modeling or set stuff, uh, light or LX for lighting, odd for audio, which is usually line arrays, plot for non-physical stuff like a center line marker, dim for all of my dimensions, and that makes it easy for me to keep things organized. But as I said, everybody has their own method of building Vectorworks files uh, that appeals to them. But I will say this, if you send out a Vectorworks file and you put everything into the none class, rest assured that nobody likes you. Please don't do that. Another note about working in both Vectorworks and Cinema, we'll talk about Cinema a little bit further down, I find a 3D mouse to be invaluable to my workflow. Uh, the one I use is the 3D Connection Space Mouse Compact, uh, which I think is their least expensive model. And in fact, it's the only device of this sort that I can find. It's sort of a, I have it here, sort of a puck shaped device where you move the puck in the ways that you want the 3D object on screen to move. It takes a bit of practice to get the hang of moving around with it. But once you do, it's great. Uh, I think the model I have costs about $130. Um, in my view, it's not too burdensome of an investment if you do a lot of 3D modeling work. So here we come to our first deliverables or the things that we want to be able to hand to the end client. Once all of your modeling and lighting design is done, it's time to create some view sheets in your software showing your drawing in some different ways. So here I have several views that make it into almost every design packet that I hand to a client. And we'll go through those now. So always some elevation views. Every design has at least a front elevation uh, with and without dimensions and a side elevation, again, with and without dimensions and a top view with and without dimensions. Uh, these give anybody who's looking at the design a clear picture of what you have in mind. And the dimensions help to convey a sense of scale. Of course, all of these help to convey a sense of scale. Uh, some isometric views. Usually I do a few of these, again, with and without dimensions, and they're usually hidden line. Uh, wireframe views tend to get really complicated in 3D, so using hidden line renders here will keep things looking better. I usually do these views in color. This one is not, uh, but no texture. That way the viewer gets a sense of how many fixtures of each type there are, and also it makes it easier to differentiate different pieces of the stage. Right, So having different uh, sections of truss being drawn in different colors will help them stand out from each other, uh, for instance. Uh, some perspective views. Uh, here's where I typically take things artistic, and I use one of the Vectorworks artistic styles to do what is essentially a, a hidden line render with some very pretty lines. Uh, the perspective view, again, helps to convey a sense of scale. Um, and then there are some what I call, what I've heard called white studies or ambient occlusion renders. Uh, these show just shapes, they're just white. Um, the idea is to show like the shape and the texture of the set, not textures in a 3D modeling sense. I mean like the forms and shapes that make up the set uh, without any distraction of color or anything else. So one thing that you should make uh, for whatever plotting software you're using is a nice looking title block that all of your pages that you render out have on it. Mine has my company logo and spaces for the, the client name, the venue, the date, the tour name, page number, all of that. Uh, there are some really good YouTube tutorials for how to make those since depending on what version of Vectorworks or plotting software you use, they can be hard to get perfect. They're not intuitive. Um, and it's different across you know, different versions of Vectorworks. Alternatively, you can make one in just your image editing program. The disadvantage of doing that is that they won't auto update in case you add a new page or insert a page. So, uh, so from here, I go into refining the design in Cinema 4D. Cinema 4D is a 3D modeling program. Again, like Vectorworks, it is big and it is expensive and it has a bit of a learning curve. There are alternatives for rendering things. And I'm guessing that there are probably at least 10 people in the audience screaming Blender at me. Yes, 
Blender is a fine piece of software. I have used it before. It is a very mature 3D modeling program. It has a lot of features and most notably it's free. You cannot beat the price of Blender. And there are many really good tutorials on YouTube that will teach you how to use it. But this is the thing. Uh, there are some things that Cinema 4D does better, in my opinion. In particular, uh, the MoGraph module is used heavily by my lighting plugin. And it's something that Blender it just isn't compatible with. Um, you can model uh, volumetric lighting also within Blender. And don't get me wrong, but setting up like a concert or entertainment lighting scene is going to take much longer with without the, the advantage of something like the stage plugin, which we'll talk about below. So for reasons of time and headache, I chose to invest in Cinema 4D, but I can't really blame anyone who chooses not to pull the trigger on spending that kind of cash just for a rendering program. Um, now, in terms of use case scenarios, there's some overlap between Cinema and Vectorworks. Uh, sometimes I find things easier to model in Cinema than in Vectorworks, and that's really true, I think, of anything that has any sort of complex intersecting curves of any sort. Uh, there are people who are better at, at doing vector works than I am, and yeah, I can acknowledge that. Um, so I typically have some back and forth. I'll go over to cinema, back to vector works. Um, I also like to do texturing in cinema because I finally, frankly find the texturing in vector works to be a little bit more difficult and to use a technical term, wonky. Another thing that I do at this stage before I move on to the lighting is I add actors to the stage. Now, my version of cinema comes with some 3D people. You can also buy them on a site like TurboSquid, but I typically don't use them unless I'm modeling a talking head type scene or a conference. I find that it's easier and allows more customization to create what Vectorworks would call an image prop. So if you've ever played uh, like Wolfenstein 3D or like some early DOS games, you know what I'm talking about. It's a flat plane of sprites that always faces the camera to sort of give a fake 3D appearance. I do this in Cinema by just making a flat plane, standing it on end and applying a texture of the band members with an alpha transparency to it. Um, Usually for at least the lead singer, I'll try to find an image of them off of the internet. And I'll spend some time in Photoshop or an equivalent program. I actually use Affinity Photo, uh, cutting them out of the background so that I can composite them cleanly into the cinema scene. Once their texture is applied to the plane, there is a tag that you can set in cinema called look at camera, which does exactly what it says. It makes that plane always be facing the camera at a 90 degree angle or whatever angle you set. Speaking of cinema tags, here's another one for you. Uh, to apply to your camera, it is called the protection tag. If you apply it and uncheck every box except for the bottom one, that will help prevent rolling the horizon left or right, which is really easy to do and it's really disorienting if you're using a 3D mouse. Once the stage set design itself, sans lighting is complete and textured, etc., I will add in the venue. So for arenas, I have a basic arena model that I reuse. I have a low poly crowd that I can drop in. Stage, again, we'll talk about stage below. Stage actually includes a generator for crowds. If you need it, um, we'll talk about stage in a minute. Once all that is set up, then I will start to work on the lighting. So this is a two-step process wherein I export the Cinema 4D file out of Vectorworks. And then I export the MVR, my virtual rig, with just the lighting. Why? Well, I find it easier to clean up the layers and objects in just the set design first within Cinema. And then once that's done, import the MVR. It should be noted here that MVR has some things about it that aren't uh, perfect, particularly XYZ rotation for fixtures. Um, it gets imported wrong like 95% of the time. So you have to set aside several minutes after you do an MVR import uh, to going through your file and fixing fixture orientation. I do not know if this happens on import or export. I don't know the technical details of the glitch. It is something to be aware of. Um, hopefully it will be fixed at some point in the future. Uh, for MVR import and all of my renders, I use, I know I've mentioned it a couple of times, the Stage 2 plugin from Hantmade, which I think is really excellent. Stage is a plugin that adds a library of lighting fixtures that can be controlled from a little interface, a little basic control interface from within Cinema. 
there's no way that I'm aware of to get real DMX data into stage because internally, like the fixtures aren't built that way. They're not built like real fixture personalities. And there are internal ways of doing things like saving cues and playback. Also, cinema isn't really intended to be a visualizer, although it would be interesting to see if you could use it as one if you optimized the code for Power 9 CPUs and then ran it on Summit at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, once all the lights are correctly positioned, it is time to start making scenes, which is the really fun part. I typically make about 10 static scenes, and I try to make each one different, of course, uh, with a different gobo selection, different colors, positions, uh, just like I would with a real show. I make these with Cinema's takes system, which lets you set up all your scenes and record changes between them so that when you're done, you can just render all of your takes with one button instead of having to set up your scene and then render and set up another scene and render and so on. It takes totally makes that process unnecessary and it streamlines it. All of my scenes are set to be rendered at 300 DPI with a fairly high resolution. I also do a few takes that are rendered as animations. Um, those get rendered at a much lower resolution than the pictures do, around 800 by 600. I might up that at some point in the future if I get some better hardware, but for the moment, it works okay with the social media posts. They upscale pretty okayly. Um, higher resolution animations would really increase my rendering time almost exponentially. So with my current hardware setup, it's not worth it. Stage also does moves for lights and it has an effects generator and animations are where I get the most use out of that feature. So since I do all this work on my laptop currently, once I get the takes set up, I have a render preset with a really low resolution and DPI for testing. Uh, I hit render takes to picture viewer. I make a Manhattan and I walk away for a day or two while the fans run wildly. At the end, I have about 10 high resolution stills and a few animated movie files. Now, how to present these to your client? Well, it depends on your timeline and it depends on the client. For a full on awesome presentation, I have some folders that I had printed with my company name and my logo. I actually meant to grab one to show you, but I forgot. Uh, and I have a space with a business card to go into. I have the render stills all printed out. I have all the vector work sheet. I have the narrative. Everything is printed out. That gets put into the presentation folder and then it gets mailed to the client usually or I can hand it to them in person. I can't recommend, by the way, a folder enough. Um, they're just a simple and expensive way to make your stuff look professional. Now, the narrative is a piece that we haven't really talked about, which is a trick that I picked up from my friend John Featherstone at Lightswitch. When pitching to clients, he writes up a few pages on his designs and he walks the client through the visual aspects of the design and why he picked them. This, I think, does a few things. It communicates intent to the viewer when you can't be there to do it yourself. Um, it helps to sharpen your own thoughts about why you chose certain things. So when writing this document, explain your design choices, explain your inspirations, your muses, and do your best to tie these choices together with the budget you have to work with. In fact, saying in the document that you designed with budgets in mind is always a good idea. To, it's a good idea to plant in the minds of any production managers who might see your work and you did design with the budget in mind, right? Other than that, I think that words that evoke specific feelings, emotions, times, and materials are some of the most effective, including the list that you see here. And the upshot here is that there are almost limitless adjectives to be found. Try to use visual language for people who might not necessarily be technically minded people. If all else fails, you pull out a thesaurus, see where the spirit leads you. Walk the reader through your design, pointing out certain features, describe key moments within the production, try to give them a feel for the overall emotion that you're trying to evoke from the audience. You could say things like, 
This riser design completes the visual motif on the floor of the performance space, a clean yet modern look that elegantly frames the upstage wall with the iMag and the video content, but provides its own interesting surface for the interplay of light and texture. Try to use that visual language, avoid the vocabulary of lighting, paint a picture with your words. And another powerful tool to use, particularly for non-technical people who need to look at your work, are mood boards and style boards. These are just pages. Uh, you can print them out, you can make them as JPEGs, where you call some images from the internet or from books you have or any source, any source at all, uh, that can help give your client an idea about atmosphere. Multiple boards representing different atmospheres can be really, really helpful. It doesn't have to be just one. Uh, really, if you're particularly if you're in a preliminary phase where you aren't sure what direction the client will want to go, um, here are a few examples. Actually, it's one example that I put together to show you what I mean. Uh, these can be really helpful in evoking a specific feeling, and they can help to put the client into the mindset of choosing an atmosphere of emotion that resonates with them. And remember they're trying to evoke an emotion through their performance too. So if you've missed the mark, and that happens all the time, at the very least, a document like the one we're talking about will let you and your client have a common language to refer back to. So if they want something that's more spooky and less delicate, you've given them the opportunity and hopefully, some meaningful vocabulary to articulate their desires in a way that will involve a shared understanding for both of you. At the end of all this, poetry and lighting though, single note of caution about keeping perspective, particularly when dealing with an artist or their creative team, um, you know, as opposed to a, a management sort of team whose job it is to sort of keep an eye on the budget of the project. Um, you have to remember that you are ultimately bringing their vision to life. And the most important thing isn't the lighting, and it isn't the production design, but it's the act themselves. You can have 500 lights doing amazing programming, but if none of those lights are providing light for your artist or gelling with the show that they're trying to put on stage, the entire thing is a waste of time and electricity. Without proper communication, a complex stage design is gonna be filling space. And that's all it's gonna do, unless the artist interacts with it. Um, and especially with thrust or B stages, they're only going to interact with it if they're really feeling it. So that, that back and forth, that understanding is so important. So then what follows is a case study from my own past. Um, we're going to walk through the experience to get together to examine what we've learned on how to pitch a design to a new client that you haven't worked with before. So some might call this speculative work or spec work, uh, meaning that you're pitching ideas without getting paid to come up with them. Or perhaps you've been given a largely show us what you think the show should look like uh, sort of design brief or uh, you have a band that doesn't really care and just expects you to come up with something cool. Lots of bands and clients that I've worked with in the past have been that way. Um, they had a budget. They had sort of a vague idea about how concerts should look. And I worked largely unimpeded within those parameters. I'm not interested in getting into a sort of debate about whether or not you should do unpaid spec work. I have an opinion, but my opinion is informed by my privilege. And anyway, I break that rule all the time. Uh, sometimes spec work is the only way to get yourself out there. And this business is complicated and situational rules are always context dependent. So I think it's important not to be black and white and say never do spec work because the reality is that for a lot of young designers, there is not a realistic chance that they will be noticed or paid attention to if they don't. So we will start with this set that I designed without 
any input, any input from the client. This is my conceptual design for one of the major political party conventions here in the United States. Uh, let me be clear here that I am not advocating any political philosophy one way or the other. This is a stage design. It is only that. It is nothing more. The reason I drew this was because at the time I had reason to believe that I might be able to get this design in front of them. And then the global health crisis happened and everything moved online. And so now it gets to be a case study for us. We get to look at what I did and how I did it. So the process, as always, starts with inspiration. In this case, I went back and looked at previous designs. That is always a good place to start. You don't want to end up duplicating someone else's work. Now, this account uh, had been managed for a while by Bruce Rogers and the excellent designers at Tribe. So I looked over their work to see what might change for this iteration of the production design. Um, in previous cases, I saw a design that had sort of literal elements to it, these sort of uh, Romanesque columns and faux stone uh, in the case of the 2008 convention, or in the case of the 2016 convention, uh, there was a more abstract truss and lights design that was very uh, evocative. It was very spectacular. In trying to put my own spin on things, I decided to take my design away from straight truss and lines and away from Roman sorts of looks and try something more organic and flowing. So I uh, start by drawing some basic shapes and ideas and doing my best to concurrently come up with the words that defined the symbolism of what I was going for. And, and here's my first attempt. Uh, the patchwork motif in the first sketch I wanted to symbolize the coming together of many ideas into a cohesive whole. Now, after I drew it, I decided that it looked a little bit too much like grandma's quilt. So I drew some other designs around the ideas of water, the forms of waterfalls and rivers, thinking about how I might turn these into design elements. Since the environment and sustainability is such a part of our national and global conversation these days, I decided that I wanted to incorporate something evocative of water. Um, these early concepts are, again, they're just assemblages of just sort of uh, shapes that don't really resemble the final product at all, but they're still valuable. These notebooks have ideas from many years inside of them, and each one could hopefully, maybe potentially end up being someday useful uh, in some context. Ideas are like tools in a toolbox. You might not need them now, but someday you might end up being really happy that you have them and that you saved them. So save your sketches. After playing around with some different ideas uh, around these shapes, I finally decided on a large triform design with three repeating sections, uh, five actually. Uh, that comes back to the idea of iterating your designs, creating successive variations on what you've drawn. I did a bunch of different versions of each element, some open, some closed, some curved, and some straight. And I even once decided that I liked the look of, once I decided, sorry, that I liked the look of the thing, I did a few more variations just to interrogate the final product and decide that I liked that one the best. Uh, finally, after I got the general shape, I wanted to go and figure out what a good background would be. Uh, since these events are broadcast, the look for the presenters on the iMag is very important. And I wanted something that would be bold, but also take color nicely and blend into the background while providing a bit of texture. And I finally settled on this sort of organic leafy treetop texture with some lovely uh, negative space for the background to fill in the sides. I decided that the center section would either be a large LED or a projected screen, and then I filled in the rest of the stage with the other screens. And since I wanted the set to stay organic and flowing, I wanted a minimum of straight lines, so I made the other screens curved. And finally, to help balance everything out and add a bit of warmth, I decided that these large structures would be made of what 
uh, would look like wood, just uh, class it up a bit and sort of keep the organic theme going throughout the design. So that completed, uh, I started to model this set that I had drawn. Now, remember how I said that there can be some crossover between Vectorworks and Cinema 4D? In this case, the forms that I had drawn were, I knew, going to be difficult for me to make in Vectorworks. And so I decided that the best way to draw this stage would be in Cinema 4D. And right away, I needed to decide on the stage itself and how that might be laid out. So for reasons of width, I did the stage as a 50 foot by 50 foot square, but I turned it sideways. And then while in cinema and modeling, I decided that the floor should be another nod to the water theme, uh, combining the look of a sort of topographical map with the obvious blue color choice. Uh, so this is where using cinema for my initial model turned out to be really helpful because this crazy multi-level steps thing for the floor uh, took me around 20 minutes in cinema uh, to get a final product. And it would have been, I think, probably quite a bit more time and headache if I tried to do it in Vectorworks. Uh, that remained true when it came to model this curved shape that makes up the main screen, along with the additional curved shapes that make up the side elements and the other curved screens. So I used Cinema's Volume Builder for this, which allowed me to model everything as NURBS curves first and then apply some volume to it and fill it all out before texturing it. So for the lighting, I exported the model to, from Cinema and into Vectorworks uh, to do the lighting. Vectorworks is suited to this sort of work much more so than Cinema 4D, although you can easily place lights with the Stage 2 plugin. Um, but regardless of that, I wanted the ability to make a proper plot if I needed to, and that necessitated importing my model into Vectorworks. So in any event, <clears throat> doing the lighting design within Vectorworks gave me more options for generating paperwork, um, options that I wouldn't have had within Cinema. So I wanted to make sure that the design was fully represented in both formats. Now I had a model uh, along with the lighting design, and it was time to export the lighting design layers out of Vectorworks and into a format that Cinema would like. And for that, of course, I used MVR. Of course, we still have that bug that we had to deal with, so that took a few minutes to fix the rotation of all of the fixtures. But after that, it was a matter of setting up the scenes to render. I have a low polygon asset depicting a large crowd that I bought a few years ago from the TurboSquid website, um, <clears throat> along with a relatively accurate, as I said, uh, model of an arena. By the way, uh, a great place to find a variety of decent 3D models that you can use in your own renderings is the 3D warehouse from Trimble. Uh, like I said, they make uh, or they own the SketchUp brand. Uh, their 3D warehouse is free to download from, and there are a lot of there's a lot of user created content. Um, there's some varying quality among that, but you can often find great models of exactly what it is you're looking for. And as I said, it's free. Uh, so finally, time to set up our lighting scenes. This political event uh, is a little bit different from lighting things like a concert. It's it's a big conference. Uh, so there's a requirement for a lot of even coverage and white light because of the IMAG coverage. So that's how I set up my lighting scenes here. And I used some large area lights to do the audience lighting. Um, I did want to make sure that a tiny bit of haze was present in the renders just because it helps to showcase the lighting rig and the lens flares help to add a little bit of realism and some, some sparkle. Uh, for this event, too, there would also be many, many large banks of TV lighting, which I did not choose to render in these simply because I'm not trying to show off the audience. I'm trying to show off the, the set design that I made. And the area lights that I threw on the audience model worked for that. And they sort of showed it in TV lighting mode, which I thought was fine. So I usually do about 10 static scenes and some animations. And then if this had been the real thing that I was going to send to a producer of this event, <clears throat> I would have uh, printed out the static scenes. I would have dropped the animations and the other stuff, stuff into Dropbox and printed out a URL uh, for the potential end client 
uh, and put all that stuff along with the narrative document printed out and signed into my folders and I would have sent it off. So this sort of work can be really fun, but it has a pretty low return rate. Um, and I realized as the global health crisis set in that time was against me. So I'll, I turned this into nothing more than an exercise for myself. I decided to set the animations and the static scenes to some fun symphonic music and I posted it on my social media accounts. Again, just for fun. And sometimes you have to be willing to take these sorts of exercises as only exercises for yourself. Nothing is ever a given in this industry. So if it goes nowhere, uh, then at least you can know that you learned something for yourself in the experience. And now for something completely different, <clears throat> let's examine a slightly different workflow from the context of a client who had input throughout the design process. And here we will focus less on the rendering and the workflow lighting design, and we'll look at more of the revision process because where I started was not where I ended up. The design that we'll be considering is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, it's a version of a set that I did for Halsey's Hopeless Fountain Kingdom Tour, uh, which I was privileged to be the LD on. Ultimately, the artist uh, chose to go with Sooner Ruthier's really great design. Uh, but the designs that I did for this tour were, they were a great learning experience for me. And I really enjoyed doing them. So to start with, I got a design brief that went something like, show us something cool. Now, <clears throat> admittedly, that is not much to go on, but I had the advantage of having gotten a little bit uh, of intel from the last moments of the previous tour, a next tour teaser video. Uh, and the, the video showed a woman ascending into some clouds and there were some vague suggestions from management people that the next tour would be all about the ascension from the Badlands, which is this sort of conceptual world from the first album, to a more uh, heavenly realm where all was not as it seemed. So with that in mind, I started out sketching some large angelic forms uh, that could serve as vertical towers. I tried them in a couple different orientations. Um, and I put an emphasis on texturing the entire set with a sort of crystalline look that I thought would help to reinforce the heavenly themes. Now, looking back, I would have done some additional development on this design. I would have done something more interesting on the floor in particular, but this was pretty quickly developed. <clears throat> so I designed this thing that you see, uh, drew it really quickly in SketchUp. I submitted it to my production manager. Sadly, I lost the SketchUp and the Vectorworks files of this design uh, due to a compression error a couple of years ago. So I don't have the pictures, which is a bummer I'd like to show you, but it's okay. You can see my sketches. And the comments came back as, wow, this is interesting. Not the direction I would have expected. So quite naturally, that's not really what I wanted to hear. That's not what any of us as designers want to hear, right? Uh, and this brings me to my first point about submitting work when other people are involved. And there are always other people involved. Um, it's always going to be true. Your work is going to be critiqued. That is just a fact. Incorporating the feedback that you get, whether it's positive or negative, in a gracious and easy manner is an opportunity to get your ideas out. And even if the client doesn't like the direction you're headed, now you have an idea in your back pocket to use for something else. This goes back to the idea of there is no bad design. There's just, uh, there's just preliminary designs if they're not going to be used, right? So uh, he suggested, my production manager, decide, uh, suggested doing something more interesting with the floor of the set. So it wasn't so two-dimensional, fair enough. So I started doing iterations of what this could look like. And that brings me to my second suggestion for when you're doing this sort of back and forth with a client or their duly appointed representatives. If you have the time, try and do different versions of your drawings so that you have them ready to go. They don't have to be fully formed, modeled, and rendered just to do some, some quick sketches of the different ways that certain design elements could go. 
after a few of these back and forth uh, sessions with the production manager, we got to a place where he seemed to like it. And he told me that he would go to the client with what, uh, what I had come up with. And a few days later, I heard back with a totally new set of instructions. The client did not think that this was the way to go. And he had a new design brief, which was base the set design around Baz Luhrmann's 1997 modern retelling of Romeo and Juliet, the one with Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio. Which meant, of course, that my sort of crystalline, heavenly realm type production design was so far outside what the client wanted to see that it was unusable in this context. And that's okay. When you finally get something to go on like that, it can be really freeing. I had never seen that movie. I had never thought about doing a set design around Romeo and Juliet modern retelling. So I had to sit down and watch it. And then I had to go back to the metaphorical drawing board and figure out how to interpret that film in a set design context. So I watched the film, decided to go with something more church themed. Now, here's where inspirations like being given a specific film can be a bit of a double-edged sword because you have a strongly visual medium to watch. You'll have to be careful to balance basing your designs too much off of the visual identity of the inspiration you've been handed, but also you have to take care not to incorporate too little. It can be a bit of a difficult balancing act. In my case, I decided to reinterpret the church from the film while incorporating sort of grand Gothic architecture influences that I felt would give Ashley, who's a really physically energetic performer, a chance to showcase her talents. So I started by drawing the upstage screens as large window shapes and doing the floors, the stairs, and the railings in a sort of faux stone texture. And then in a nod to the angel wings that Claire Dane's character wears in the party scene in the film, incorporating a large flown and motion controlled set element in the form of an abstract set of angel wings that float and move above the stage. This version of the set was done over the course of a gig on the Chicago Auto Show. It was some of the most sleep deprived, fast set of drawings I've ever done. <laughs> Uh, but when I sent the first drafts to the production manager, what I heard back was a great thing to hear. Yes, he liked the direction that this was going and to keep going in that direction. So that brings me to the third step that I have for work of this sort, which is once you get to something that the client likes, interrogate why they like it to give you an idea of which part of the designs to focus on going forward, which ones to develop the most. In this case, he liked the atmosphere of it, the cathedral feeling, the focus on architectural elements like the screens. So uh, now that I had something to go on, I could continue to refine the design and go making little improvements. Uh, the balusters of the stairs needed a drastic reworking to give them more life. They started out as just spindles. I incorporated uh, the same shapes of the screens into some neon LED elements that would uh, outline each of the upstage lighting towers and the IMAG screens. And then once I had the PM's approval of the, the general shape of the set, I went into designing and rendering the lighting. And again, referring back to my given inspiration here, I wanted the lighting to be very stylistic and moody. And so that's the sort of design that I did with my renders. I wanted to really emphasize the LED neon and put lots of powerful lights above the wing to help uh, reveal its form as an architectural element within the design. I also started using this time to come up with some interesting moments, which is something I think every production design needs. I planned to have one moment with uh, the artist lit only from above with a realistic rose petal confetti falling around her, another nod to the film, and with another uh, with the wing sort of nearly touching the stage with the motion controlled wings sort of wrapping around her. At this point, uh, I was pretty happy uh, with what I had come up with. So I rendered everything as before, uh, with about 10 static shots and some video, 
I wrote up my design narrative, emphasizing how I incorporated the inspiration into the design, taking the reader through some of the, the reasoning behind the choices that I made and inviting further collaboration. And then I, I went to FedEx office. I printed everything off. I signed it with my nice pen. I put it into one of my, my folders and I sent it off. And then I didn't get the design, sad face, but that's okay. It was a great learning experience. And I ended up being beaten by Sooner Ruthier. She is one of the best in the business. So in that sense, it was a positive experience and an honor. And I got to work with her on the show anyway, which was a blast. So to wrap up, what we have, have we learned by examining these two processes? Well, really both processes are related to each other. One involves refining and iterating your designs while incorporating feedback from an external stakeholder. And the other involves you being that stakeholder and doing your best to guess what your client would love to see while drawing from your own experiences and then sending it off. Clearly the second process involves the first, um, but the second will most often will, will more often be more challenging from the perspective of incorporating feedback coming from a point of view that you might not have considered before. Certainly, I hadn't considered Baz Luhrmann before. Uh, so to recap the overarching process of thin, sending things to clients, the process begins with design. You conceptualize, you research, and you sketch. You solicit feedback in the next step, either from your own internal process of evaluating and critiquing your own work or from someone else or a big team of someone's else giving you feedback. And finally, you interrogate that feedback. You incorporate it into your concepts and your sketches and you iterate the design. Repeat for as long as necessary to get to a finished product. Three steps, but to do this process well, takes a lot of time, a lot of thinking. For handing things to clients, I recommend at least 10 static shots, some animations if you're feeling plucky, and some technical style drawings that show the rig and how it's laid out, along with a design narrative. Putting these into a nice looking folder is always a good idea. If for no other reason, then it will help keep your stuff from blowing away in a poorly timed gust of wind. Finally, the best piece of advice that I have ever heard, again, from John Featherstone, is this. Make an effort whenever designing for someone else to truly, truly listen. Actively listen, not only to the client, but to everyone involved. And try really hard to give everyone on a project a sense of ownership. Good ideas can come from anywhere. And when people feel personally invested in a project, they will do some of their best work. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. I want to again thank Martin Professional for the chance to be here with all of you today. I want to also thank you, the audience members who took time out of your day, your Zoom calls, your kids' dentist appointments to come watch me blab about my workflow. And, and uh, when it comes to renders and making deliverables to clients, a big thank you again to my friends, Michael Grandietti and Brad Schiller for helping to put this on and uh, for fielding all of your guys' questions. And speaking of questions, I will hand it back to Michael for a few of those. Hey, Craig, first and foremost, this has been fantastic. Um, really interesting stuff here. This is great. And like you said, we do have a handful of questions that I'm going to kind of rapid fire your way. So we'll get started yeah, here. Um, first and foremost, uh, what do you think about the Capture software? Oh, Capture, yes. Um, visualizers, uh, they can be a really good alternative to something like Cinema. Right, so you could be using uh, something like Capture. That's one of the lower cost visualizers out there. You can import custom models, um, and indeed the rendering that you can get out of those programs, especially from like their high end settings, uh, can look really good. I actually used Capture for a while like that, and I found it very adequate. Um, but visualizers don't do modeling. So for me, there's um, some value in having something like cinema 
Um, but Capture's paperwork um, has also really improved uh, in recent recent software versions. Um, so if it works for you, then then it works for you. Here's another one. Um, what do you think helped you get to where you are now? Beside, of course, being talented, do you think social media and work uh, and, and work picks, uh, posting of work picks is helpful? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, everyone is going to talk about how social media has has transformed everybody's industry. Um, and I, I think it certainly has transformed ours, uh, if only because now I've I design concert looks with Instagram in mind, right? Like that, that shot that goes on Instagram is some great advertising for you. Um, in terms of how I got to where I am, this is always a difficult question because I think that I'm very lucky, to be honest. And I think that there is a lot of good fortune involved in getting places in this industry. There are a few tips that I think will really work for anyone, no matter what you're doing. One, these are all super basic, so I apologize if, they, if, you've, if you've heard these before. One is always try to be on time. Uh, if, if you're the not on, tom, not on time guy or gal, uh, that is going to very quickly uh, give people a bad taste for working with you. Another is to always be kind. Um, I don't always succeed at this, if I'm being perfectly honest, but I try really hard uh, to, to be kind to everyone that I'm working with, whether they're above me or below me. Um, making friends in this industry is a great way to, to get work. And even if you, you know, take the time to socialize when you can, when we all can, right? Like that's kind of hard in this environment, but uh, take the time to socialize. If once you're back on a on a gig and everyone's like, Hey, we're going to go grab some drinks or we're going to go see a movie or whatever, tag along. Like there's nothing in this industry that is more important than relationships. Um, so do your best to cultivate those and absolutely work on your Insta work on your, your LinkedIn page, um, have those social media accounts that have some pictures of your work. Um, and, and maintain those. But I think ultimately, uh, those are just another tool for improving, generating, maintaining relationships. And that's really what this industry rewards. Excellent advice and could be applied to many other industries and just, you know, daily Absolutely. life as well. Yeah. Um, how do you suggest to lay out the narrative such as formatting tips, et cetera? So what I typically do is I wish I had a narrative document open that I could just show you, uh, but it's essentially a thank you for the opportunity to work on this production. I am proud to present this, this design to you. And then like I'm, usually, I'm using the words that I would use in the document. I just say, let me walk you through a few of the design. Let me walk you through a few of the design elements that I have placed in here. Um, to give you an idea of, of what we're going for. And then I just talk about it. I'll say, you know, uh, let us consider this uh, upstage sculptural piece. I wanted this to look like a trapezoid because your album art looks like trapezoids. I'm being a little off the cuff here, but it's essentially language like that. It's look at the unique, each unique piece and and just talk about it for a little bit. I try to keep the tone very conversational, very visual. Um, I, I don't say, and then we put 10 Mac Vipers running in, you know, uh, advanced personality mode. Brad's gonna, Brad's gonna say something. That's the wrong thing. I forget what the personality mode is called. Extended? Something like that. Uh, I, I, I don't say that. I don't say talk about the lighting in the device that makes it kind of way. Talk about the look, talk about the feelings that you want it to evoke and just be conversational about it. I try to keep it under two sheets. Nobody wants to read something that's like really long. Um, logo up in the top, uh, my logo. And then at the bottom, if I'm sending it to a client, uh, this is my own little personalized secret touch. I always sign it with a real pen because that's fun. Nobody likes seeing a printed out signature from a laser printer. Um, 
And yeah, like if there's a couple of different uh, textural options that you want to present to them, sometimes that can be fun. When I did the train design to pitch to them, uh, I knew that I wanted that big trapezoid to have some kind of texture. And so I put like four pictures in there and I was like, here are some of the design options that we could consider. I think this one is best. Um, and that gives them a chance to see that you've sort of done your homework and you've considered alternates. Um, but mostly I think um, have, a, have some conviction about your design, tell them, here's why I think that this is right. And I'm showing it to you and I invite the opportunity for further collaboration. And then I always put in something about the budget. Like if I think that this is gonna be a lower budget production, I say, you know, and, and it's always a budget conscious production, right? Taylor Swift is a budget conscious production. Uh, you, you always say something like that, like this was designed with the budget in mind. And, you know, uh, there are always revenues that artists want to take home. And that was in my mind when I designed this. And, you know, uh, we can adjust up or down uh, as you see fit. Like there's always options to use. That was really rambly, but I hope it, it was great. That. Um, speaking of your designs, uh, when you're developing them, do you ever mm -hmm. use real world materials, uh, foam, foam core, paper, Legos, anything creative like that? <laughs> I do. I do. I, I have a big tub of Legos and I have definitely designed with those before. Um, I know my friend Andre Petrus, I forget what the production was, but he actually built like a full scale paper mock-up. Uh, to help figure out like some tricky motor and lighting placement stuff. That can be really helpful. Um, I don't do it as much these days because typically I can I can place everything within into a into a, like a digital 3D space and get an idea for how things will work out there. But with materials, absolutely. Like if I can get samples of materials, those are wonderful. Um, and especially like if you have uh, like some fabric swatches or like a material for some kind of a set thing that would like fit into your folder. Awesome to put that in, give the, the client something tactile that they can feel, they can hold in their hands and be like, oh, this is what it would look like. This is what it would feel like. This is how it would take light. Um, that's really valuable. And it's also valuable for you as the designer uh, to sort of get that, uh, to sort of get a feel, a visceral, uh, tactile feel for, for what it'll look like and um, you can experiment it with it in your, your light lab or a flashlight. You know, as you're uh, growing and you're developing your skill set, you know, who were some of your teachers or, or the people you drew inspiration from um, before you got to this point? Oh, man. Uh, Andy Watson, uh, is Radiohead's designer. Um, I love his use of light. It's, it's, it's so good. Um, the same with John Featherstone. His, his designs... I've taken inspiration from before. Uh, gosh, Suna Ruthier uh, has, in addition to being like a fine human being, has a really amazing career uh, that is that is fantastic. Um, Baz Halpin's designs also are just uh, required reading for sure. For anybody in this industry, go back and look at the Reputation Tour, uh, look at things by uh, Tobias Rylander, uh, his stage designs for the 1975 are, they are art for sure. So I would say those guys. Awesome. Uh, we got a handful more. Um, when transitioning from your paper sketching to computer drafting, do you scan and import your sketches or start from scratch? I don't really start from scratch. I don't find that there's a lot of value in scanning things in. Scanning is, scanning will give you like a very high resolution thing to work off of, but I don't draw particularly high resolution. Uh, when I'm doing paper and pen, um, there are times, there was one time and it was the Halsey design when I based those sort of angel towers around the, around the golden ratio because I liked the way that that looked. Um, but I just wrote down, I used a calculator and I just wrote down the dimensions uh, and drew them into my, into my notebook so that when I started doing the design in Vectorworks, I would have the, uh, would have the, um, Sorry, my train of thought just got derailed. I would have the, the, the dimensions to just type in and that made it easier to follow along, but I don't usually scan. Got it. Uh, how long does it take you, take to go from your initial idea to a completed pitch packet? Well, that depends on the timeline. Uh, I will take all of the time that you can give me, basically. Uh, as I said, so with the Halsey design, it, the, the pitch came in 
while I was on the Chicago Auto Show. <clears throat> and that was, if you've ever done lighting for the Chicago Auto Show, those are some long days. Um, and I would like get back to my bedroom or my hotel room and I'm like, okay, now it is time to sit down at Vectorworks after I get something to eat. Boy, those were long. Um, but I did the, the sort of first couple of iterations of that design over like 36 hours. They weren't rendered, they weren't polished, they weren't, they weren't great. Uh, they were nothing that I would ever want to hand to Ashley or her management, but I was sending them to the, to the production manager and he understood the time constraints that we were all under. Um, if, if I have the option, like a month is great. Is a month always realistic? No. Uh, so, you know, you use the time that you, you have uh, to the best of your ability. And sometimes it has to contract, sometimes it can expand. Um, so it really just depends on the client and how much they'll give you. But to answer your question, as much as you'll give me. You know, kind of speaking to adapting to circumstances, um, have you had to do any pitches over Zoom or over video conferencing? And, and if so, how has that technology kind of impacted that process? Boy, uh, the answer is kind of. Uh, what I have done typically is to talk to management on the phone and over Zoom and get their uh, their their feedbacks and their uh, their input over a digital medium. And then I just send files, right? Like you can't always mail something. Like that is a nice thing to do to be able to provide like a physical thing for someone to hold and look at, but it's not always practical. Sometimes it's, I have dropped the JPEGs into the Dropbox, go look at them and let me know how it goes. Um, I have never sat down for like a full pitch to a client in a Zoom session. Um, I would welcome that opportunity if it came, but unfortunately I don't uh, really have the experience to, to give you a more detailed or nuanced answer to your question. Well, hopefully things are starting to get better. So I guess you'd probably uh, be open to the idea of never having to pitch over Zoom. Um, that would be nice. I got my yeah. first uh, stick in the arm just the other day. So hopefully. Absolutely. Here's a fun one. Awesome. Uh, here's a fun one. If you could design for any show or artist, uh, living or dead, um, what would it be? Or who would it be? Oh, man. Living or dead. Wow. That's a, I, uh, wow. Goodness. I think Prince would be a fun design for if I was going to go with an artist who's no longer with us, just because native son of my city here in the, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, that would be a really fun design to get. And if I was dreaming, I would say uh, churches. I have been listening to a lot lately and I think I could do some really, really fun things with their music. Um, I don't know who designs them currently. So if you're on this call, I'm not going after you, promise. It's just, I can't help but think about what I would do uh, you know, when I'm listening to the music in my brain. Awesome. Prince definitely came to mind when I, right before you answered that question. Um, <laughs> yeah. A few more before we before we wrap up for the day. Um, are your mood boards printed out or only digital images viewed on a device? <clears throat> They're both. They're both. Uh, I find that there's again value in being able to hand a end client a a printed thing for them to hold, like just the tactical sens tactile sensation of being able to hold something that you've designed for them to look at in their hands. Like there is psychological value to that. It makes it more. I don't know what it, what does it make it more concrete. It's more real to them to look at it in their hands. If I can, it's not always possible. It's not always practical. It's not always going to get there in time. So sometimes it is a JPEG, and that's fine too. So both. Excellent. For your pitch folder, do you print the pages yourself or use a professional print service? Professional, always, 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 always. I typically just it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, what I've done in the past is gone to FedEx office and just printed them out um, on like a bit of not, not super matte, but a little bit glossy uh, stock so that they have a kind of a nice sheen to them. Uh, nice paper again with the narrative and the, and the plots. Um, I do have a color laser printer, but one, <clears throat> I would use a lot of toner doing that and a lot of paper. And uh, it's kind of an older printer. So it's not like the professional quality printer that you'll get at you know, FedEx or your local print shop. So I always go the pro route. 
Final two questions here. Uh, we'll start with the first one. How do you prepare a digital pitch versus a paper version? <clears throat> That's an excellent question. I don't think that there's a lot of difference in terms of the preparation. Obviously the pitch will be something different. So if I was gonna be use something like Zoom, uh, I would probably set up a screen share like I'm doing right now and, uh, and walk them through you know, the slides of what I wanted everything to look like um, versus being in the room. I would do essentially the same thing, but with like a physical medium. Uh, yeah, not much more to that one. And uh, last but not least, we'll end with, with kind of a fun one. Um, you seem to be All a right. good artist. And how or where did you uh, learn to draw? <clears throat> I am a terrible artist. Uh, I can't really draw, which is why you see the reason you think that is because all of the things that you saw were very low res. You couldn't see all of the mistakes. Uh, I don't draw very well. I don't think, I mean, trust is just like a couple of lines with a squiggly in between it. Um, I guess I've gotten better over the years. I really struggle with drawing people. I can't draw people for crap. I've even got a couple of books that like purport to teach you how to draw the human figure. Uh, doesn't matter. I can't do it. Uh, so thank you for the compliment. Um, well, you've at least fooled uh, some of the people in attendance <laughs> today with that question. Um, that's going to wrap it up. Craig, I want to definitely thank you for your time. This has been an awesome session. Thank you for your amazing words to even start the session. And uh, thank you to our attendees who joined us and for all the uh, amazing questions. The recorded version of this webinar will be available here in the coming days. So definitely be on the lookout for that. And also be on the lookout for all of our upcoming webinars in audio, video, lighting, and control. And definitely make sure to check those out and, and tune in and catch those live or catch the recorded versions as well. Craig, thanks, you, thanks, thanks again for your time and for this awesome session. And uh, everybody, you know, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Craig. Great job once again. Thank you, Brad. Enjoyed it.